Hey, uh, I'm Skip Wilbur. I've been a member of this club for 18 years. How I know that is I, re I, I joined right after I retired, and I've been retired 18 years. That's the only way I can figure that out. Uh, anyways, uh, it's, it's been real fun, and I, w I plan to make this fun. First of all, cell phones off, ringers off, if you would. And the other thing, too, you can interrupt me at any time during this. There are no such thing as a stupid question unless it comes from the back row. <laughs> okay. They all know who they are. That goes without saying. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, last uh, meeting we had a, a, a relatively new couple, husband, wife, that was sitting over here. Do you remember their names? Do you remember that? But he asked this, I'm going to paraphrase this, but he asked the question about why couldn't you just take a chunk of wood and put it into the, and, and clamp, I'm, going off, I'm going off script here for just a minute, off base. And I just want to show you something. We're going to make what I consider a perfect tenon. Now, is, is anybody, how many Vicmar chuck owners do we have here? How many? My suggestion is, this is what comes with it. You might want to take that and throw that away. Yeah. Get something like this. This is $5 on, on Amazon. And the reason is, it, it, it's the same it's the same tool like that, but it's got this little outcrop that you can put in here. Now you got a big lever. Okay? Just a little helpful bit there. Um, anyways, we're going to try to, to make a what I consider is a perfect tenon. <coughs> Thank you. Now the question, I want to, again, I'm paraphrasing. The question was, why can't you just put this into the chuck? Well, you can't. But it's not going to be not going to be worthy of it. Okay, I'll just show you something here. I, I lay in a bed that night. I got nothing else to do at night. You know, you lay in bed and you start thinking. Sit down. Everyone's everyone. A lot of people jumped on that and said, "Well, wait a minute. You got to put a, a, a shoulder on it, a tenon." Well, it, it's in there, but it's not. If I if I put any type of lateral force on here, it's going to start wiggling, and you'll get some some yucky stuff going on. The one thing you have to consider is when they do, you got an overhead going on? Uh, what is that? When they do a chuck, what they'll do is cut it in force. So the, the close, the, the tighter that is to where it, it was disassembled means that it's going to grip that tenon better than any other position. If, if, if you have a large tenon and you've got these short rungs here, these here, it's going to grip it out here. There's going to be like eight different places it's going to grip it. So that's, just keep that in mind. And the other thing we're going to consider is, is this is a, a basically, this, this is, not basically, this is a tapered tenon. And what I do, this is only me doing it. You don't have to do this. You don't have to have this is, uh, oh, where's that little piece here? Uh, oh, there it is. I've, I've got, this is a badan. And it's, can you see, I've, I've got it cut at an angle. Can you see that angle there? This is the, the dovetail, the jaws. And I've got it cut, so, wait a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna screwing that up. Oh, here we go. Can you see that? I've got it cut about seven, eight degrees, so it fits right into there. You see that? And all I have to do is come in from the side and do a, a shear, a scraping cut, and go right down to that size that's real close to the closing of those jaws. Follow me so far? Now, the other part of that is this, you don't want these you don't want to bottom this thing out in those jaws because you're not getting the support across his face. So the, this tool here is, is a 10 millimeter tool, which is 3 eighths. And the last I, I knew, the 3 eighths is sh shorter than a half an inch because it's a half an inch from here to here. Meaning that if I come in just visually and get in here, and as you can see, is that the, is that the size of the... See that? It's about the size of that tenon. That means it should sit off the bottom about an eighth of an inch. 
correct? The other factor is, and, and I do this, uh, I've always done this, I figure this isn't going to hurt you, it's certainly going to save your ass. This, this face here should be flat or slightly concave so it sits on this outer surface and more specifically on the outer edge of that surface. Okay? So, I will take a look down here and I'll say, oh, or I'll take a piece of something straight like that and say, okay, that's slightly concave, that's going to work. Or I'll just come in and just clean it up, just slide down here and come in this way. Because another factor which you're going to look for is right down in this little V area here, you want that clean as and crisp as can be. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Give me just a second. A lot of, lot of time, what I'm going to end up doing here is I'm going to pass some of, I have a lot of stuff to pass off. Bob, if I'm going to pass it to you, let it go up and around and then off over that table there. Let, let it end up on that table. Is that okay to you guys? That works. Let me just, uh, I can't emphasize this enough. I was just at somebody's home recently, very recently. What are you laughing at? And the bowl had gone across the floor. <laughs> Jeff, is he talking about you? No, I'm talking about Bill. Anyways, I didn't get that in there real tight, but, but can, you see, can you look in there and see what I'm talking about? It's got crisp edges, it's, it's laying on the other surface, and it doesn't touch the bottom. I, I, that's a little, yeah. Anyways, the, the, basically that, that was done on the Vic mark, and that's a one-way that's a one-way talent, so it's not going to lock in all the way. But you get you get the idea, right? Okay. Now let's. Uh, and by the way, that same principle is applicable to bowls. When you come around the bowl, you want a flat area, and then the tenon off the flat area, and the tenon small enough so you can just about close the jaws on it. Okay. Now, uh, okay, let me get this stuff out of the way. What my intention here is to take you through the process of thread chasing. And should I have enough time, and I think I will, is to actually make a final product toward the end. But my basic, my, my intention is to do this uh, so that you'll understand the whole process. You walk away, you can go home and practice. And by the way, practice, practice, practice. Uh, Larry, ready for the... This thread chasing stuff has been going on for somewhere around 400 years. Uh, so, hey, how you doing? You stuck in. Okay, right here, Larry. Okay, there we go. How's that? Okay, what makes a, what's a good wood to thread? There are two, two, uh, two reasons. One is hardness. Hardness is measured, hardness came up with a, uh, the, the, the flooring industry came up with that uh, test. And what is it called the Jenka scale? And what they do is they take a, a .44 inch steel ball and they try to press it into a piece of wood. When it goes in halfway, they say, oh, what kind of pressure we get? And that's what's called the hardness. The hardest, the hardest wood in the world was a wood called Australian bloke. And that's got like a 5,000 pounds per inch rating, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, and then the next thing is, what about density? Uh, density is where you have, they have a, a, one cubic foot of, of volume, of cubic foot of, of, of a container, a cubic foot, fill it with water at sea level, and they have a weight on that, and the weight is 62.4 pounds. And everything else is, is related to that, and it gives you the density rating. So they take a, a block of whatever wood they look they want to measure, in, as far as density goes, and they'll go ahead and, and weigh it, and if it's 62.4, the, the specific, they call it specific gravity, is now 1.0. And if it's more than 1.0, that wood will not flow. If it's less, it will. Okay, so awesome. 
Okay. I've been to a number of demos uh, where I've seen a lot of, of hand chasing thread people chase, and all of them, I think almost all of them, put a tack up these seven woods as their favorites. Uh, now, some of them have a little bit more than that, some a little less, but usually it's seven, these seven woods are all up there. But I want you to notice something about the hardness and density. This boxwood is probably the premier wood to hand chase. Hard to get. Here in the States, the boxwood is uh, a bush form, and overseas, they, I mean, I've seen uh, s social media start talking about, well, the English boxwood is better than the French, is better than the Turkish. I'd like to get some of that to, so I could <laughs> chime in, but it's not to be. I have some boxwood, and I got this a while ago. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass a, cu a couple of these things out. Like I say, let it go around and, and drop it off over here. This is a box that I got, I don't know, eight to ten years ago. I paid twenty dollars for that. Twenty. Twenty dollars. Still looking for a project for it. Still looking for a project. Well, and, and I want you to. And this is this is some of my experiments. This is a piece of boxwood. Feel how nice that that thread, those threads come together and, and come. Okay. Now, if you get a wood that is that expensive, you need to uh, be a little frugal and maybe cut into into a, a where you could do inserts. You might have a I don't know a box elder a vase or some other type of vase that doesn't take a thread. Well, you can put these inserts in there. And what I'll do is I take, this is a piece of boxwood, it hasn't fully dried yet, and I'll go cut it, and I'm gonna make, probably get three inserts out of that, but I drill a hole through it to help the drying process. And this is, this is a thread, and here is a, a threading, uh, one I've already done, to be, to be threaded. You see how that works? Yeah. Okay. By the way, by the way, there are over 200 varieties of, of boxwoods around. In early days, they were making boxwood uh, uh, were before uh, plastics. They were using boxwoods for like uh, slide rulers. You know those old uh, post full, full, it, what post post? No, I think they were too expensive for that. <laughs> <laughs> Wagon axles. Wagon axles, yeah, probably. Uh, and and you remember those folding rulers that had the the brass. Hinges, yeah, yeah. your grandfather might have had that, yeah. uh, probably uh, boxwood. Uh, and, and, and now, and then they would have the wedding ceremonies out in the back of the church with all these boxwoods around. That's supposed to uh, ward off evil spirits. I always thought it was a wedding cake that did that. What do I have? Any questions on boxwood? Yeah? No, not on boxwood. Are you putting these up in order of preference? No. Okay. No. But, however, I, th I would say that boxwood would be my number one product, okay? Well, it has a lifespan of 200 years. <clears throat> yeah. It, some of the stuff they're, they're uh, in Europe, they're taken out of the ground now, it was planted around World War II, or pre-World War II. So you have to find somebody to replace you watering them. You got, you got an aunt over in, uh, <laughs> in Turkey? <or? laughs> Okay, the next one I would talk about ebony. Ebony, now, first of all, keep in mind, remember I said the hardest wood in the world is 5,000? Look at these numbers here, 2840 for boxwood, 0.98, 3,000, 0.97. You see, a, see what, see what you, 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 it's trying to develop now? Yeah. These have a lot of similarities, don't they? Yeah. Now, ebony, there's 11 different types of ebony, and the ebony, most of the ebony we know is called Gaboon ebony, and that's kind of, uh, uh, it, but there's, a, there's a, like I said, there's 11 other kinds. There's, there's Ceylon, Brazil, and Brazilian ebony has a, has a higher Janka scale than that ebony. It's up about 3,600. Uh, a lot of musical instruments, because all, the, all these hardwoods, dense hardwoods, have a, they call it a musical quality. Well, I don't know, I'm not a musician, but it probably reverberates or it doesn't dull the sound or something. It resonates so you just, real well. I'm sorry? It resonates real resonates, well. Resonates, okay. But anyways, uh, and then in, in ancient Asia, the the uh, the the the, uh, the the royals, the elite, you would have ebony chalices because they thought that the ebony would neutralize the poison, so it's going to try to poison. Oh. Uh, and the, you, you you will see some. Oh, I got to pass another here. 
You will see some brown streaks in ebony. Uh, this is an ebony block. Feel how, you feel how heavy this is. Okay, and this is just a little threaded box of ebony. If you look close, you can see a little bit of brownish and gray grayness in there. Oh yeah. See it? Yeah. Okay. The next one on the that list. Actually, in the wood itself. That yeah. Here. Yeah, it's in the wood. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the next one is blackwood. It's got a pretty high Janka scale, 3670 and 1.27. Meaning that if you put a piece of blackwood in the water, it's going to sink. Well, let me tell you what I, I've been doing is I've been getting um, these at some of the, the symposiums here lately. Uh, these are clarinet bills. And I would get four of them for $50, meaning they're 12 50 a piece. Uh, however, if, if anybody wants this information, Penn State Hardwoods has a sale now going on. You can get eight of these for eighty-five dollars in free shipping. It comes to ten sixty-four a piece. Okay, so it's pretty reasonable. This stuff is a real joy to work. It's kind of on the dry side. Uh, by the way, there's a cup. You can open that box up too. This is there's no finish on that. There's no finish. That just polished. No, it's just polished with with that. Uh, uh, what do you call it? A crit truffing, it, it's vinyx, uh, and it, it puts such a beautiful piano shine on it. You almost won't think that the Steinway Brothers are going to be written their name on the bottom of that. Feel how heavy it is. I'm sorry. Make clarinets out of this. Yes. yes. They make clarinets out of this. Yeah. Oh, that yes. Happens. That's a clarinet billet. Yeah. And by the way, there's two little pieces of candy in there. If one, if one, if that comes back, one missing, I have a twenty dollar bill in its place. Okay. You can have the candy. I'm gonna keep the wood, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you the twenty. Okay. <laughs> this next one is a fun wood. This is lignum vitae. Look at look at the the uh, yeah. junker rated on that. See how high that is. Lignum vitae is. Uh, oh, here, here you go. Lignum vitae, I, I got this quite a while ago. It's got a green tinge to it and it's oily. And you'll see they made a lot of bearings for ships with that lignum vitae. Because uh, it, it, it was self lubricated. Matter of fact, the, the, one of the ships on the, uh, not the ships, the submarine USS Dauntless, it's got lignum vitae uh, shaft bearings. That's a wood itself right there. No, 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 that's a, that's a cabin job. Oh, okay. yeah, that's embedded in there. It's on sites now, so you really can't get hard. You, you, you see what Carl just said? He, was, he said it's getting very rare, and uh, I, I'm fortunate. I have another piece at home too, so don't anybody come back and I love 20, 20 bucks for this. One. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here's what they're doing, Carl. They're, they're taking the Argentine government is taking and planting a, a variety of that. It's not as green. It's more on the yellow side, yeah. and they call it vera wood. You heard of that? It's a lighter wood, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's right here. It, it, exactly. It's not. It's not in the uh, forty-five hundred. It's uh, more like uh, oh, thirty-seven hundred. But it's still pretty damn hard. I, I have not turned anything from that yet. That just gives you an idea. But they made a lot of cricket balls, mallets, billy clubs, uh, stuff like that. To me, the tree, the uh, lignum vitae tree, kind of looks like a crepe myrtle where it comes up and just mushrooms up over the top. Okay. okay? Skip, where did you say the blackwood is common? It's South Africa. South Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's African blackwood. Yeah. Um, now, the next, the next one is Cocobolo, 2960 and 1.1. Cocobolo is... Uh, is a pretty wood. It's got a lot of different colors in it. If I can find the, the piece I made with it, I don't see it. Oh, oh here it is. It's got a lot of browns and reds. Uh, uh, oh, God, what do you call it? Yellow, browns, reds, some black. The darker thread, the darker threads tend to, the darker colors tend to thread better than the lighter colors. This is a piece of Coca-Cola, and this is something I made from it. A lot of this stuff, this is the first time I've ever done this with, with these uh, little experiments, so you, you're perfect to it. <laughs> um, but Coca-Cola can be 
uh, allergic, you could have an allergic reaction for that, like uh, uh, asthma, like a little asthma. Arc. So be, be cautious of that, okay? They, they do that a lot of the Coca Cola, or oboes, flutes, you know, gun grips, duck calls. It's a pretty wood, okay? Now, the next wood is called Mopani. Now, I want to tell you that I've had trouble in school in spelling, and they try to trick me here. M-O-P-A-N-I, or, or it's also spelled M-O-P-A-N-E. And I'll tell you how much trouble I had in school one day, it was M day. And the teacher said, Skip, name something that starts with M that you're not good at. I said, spelling. So. <laughs> Skip? Sure. I'll send this out to everybody. I see some people taking notes. We'll send it out. As Did you hear what Larry said? Yeah. No. He said he'll, you're taking notes, it's not that necessary, he'll send an email to you on some of this, this slide presentation I'm showing you. Oh, the slide presentation, I'll send you a uh, PDF of it. Okay. Uh, a lot of wood instruments were made with Opani, and uh, I have, I have, oh, here it is here, I have not made anything with it yet, I just have the wood, I, and it, oh, that's me. Okay. I got this, a few, I got this two by two by six. Maybe a few years ago, but it wasn't that. Didn't seem like that's that expensive. But I haven't turned it yet, so I can't comment on that. Um, it's interesting that uh, the Mopani in its native state looks like uh, some. They use it in landscaping because it looks like a piece of driftwood, and they'll also have smaller pieces like inside of an aquarium, and it looks like driftwood. And you can see it's going to sink; it won't float up. Uh, it's, what's also interesting, remember uh, David Livingston, the adventurous that went through Africa? Yeah. He said the Mopani tree got hit by lightning, but more than any other tree. So if you're out in Africa and it's lightning storm, don't go under a Mopani tree. Okay? <laughs> Here we go with pink ivory. Now, I haven't, I haven't made anything with pink ivory either. But this, uh, this is a hell of a lot more expensive. That was $8. This is $22. Okay. The pink wow. ivory is, is a, and I've seen it, a pink wow. ivory, beautiful wood. It's got a, it's a reddish in color. It's a lot of times we'll take pink ivory like a billiard cues and mix it with like maple or, or a, uh, some other light colored wood and then a dark wood as well, mix it up. It has some beautiful tonal qualities. Um, What's, what's interesting, uh, there, there was no health, they, I, I, what I read is there's no health issues with that. You, there's someone who gets an allergy with pink ivory. But it's very rare, and it's very South African. And matter of fact, there, there was a king, in, the Zulu king in Africa, used to run around with a, a pink ivory cane. And if anybody outside the royal family owned pink ivory, you better watch it, you're going to get whacked. They didn't like you. It's that rare. Okay? Okay, now the other... Oh, Osage Arch. We, we, you, you all know Osage Arch? Yeah. Uh, Osage Orange is... Uh, okay, where's my Osage Orange item? Oh, that's not it. Maybe you didn't take it. It's the back of that black thing. Oh, here it is, right here. Osage Orange is, uh, what do you get, 26, 20, and 0.86. Uh, this is quite common as a hardwood here in the States. They call it Bodoc, uh, Hedge Apple. You've heard it called Hedge Apple, Bodoc. Horse Apple. Horse Apple. But Bodoc is a, uh, a, a French word for bow wood, because they use that a lot in archery. Yeah. Uh, Deal. Okay. And how do you spell it? B O I S D A R C. You know, go figure. I can tell you stories about French. <laughs> um, hedge apple, horse apple. But that will, if you take that as a scrub wood and put it in your fireplace, that's going to kick out more BTUs than any other North American wood. It does. Not burning. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it, it put, uh, a hickle out of the Indians made bows and arrows. Yes, that's, that's what bodak means is is bowwood. Wow. Yeah. 
and we have one in our pasture over a hundred years old. Well, when are we going to cut it down? <laughs> <laughs> if it does, I'm gone. How many have that Never. <laughs> Party at her house. Okay, now now we're coming to an area that. I should say it's controversial. Some people say it's okay to turn, some people, whatever. I just call it okay woods. These are woods that I've tried that are just it just kind of okay. The holly, but look at the, the hardness of holly. It's not that hard. And a lot of guys were writing about how good holly was. Um, I, don't have, I just have this as a holly. Okay. This is a piece of holly I just did, I think, a week or so ago. Uh, <coughs> But, but take a look at the threads in there, they're not, they're not crisp, they're kind of crumbly, a little bit crumbly, yeah. uh, and, and I'm not that thrilled with holly. I mean, it's a beautiful wood, I, all that is is sanded, there's no finish on that, I just sanded it. Give you the trash and all. What? Uh, I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh, holly, in, in, in other wood, is a dogwood. Dogwood's a little bit harder, and I like dogwood. As a matter of fact, I have a piece here. We may try it. Uh, dogwood. Here's a piece of dogwood. There's no finish on this. This is just sanded. I think if you see it, it looks like a little uh, wax in there. That's from the wax I used when I, when I did the foot chasing. But feel how nice, feel how nice that comes together. I'm okay with dogwood. And another wood is uh, extra small is Bradford pear. Bradford pear is another nice wood that it's plentiful. And it's got a nice slide to it too. Okay? You, you, you're gonna go home you're gonna go home tonight and you'll be trying this all weekend, I guarantee you. Uh, oh another word another wood that I have not been able to get a hold of is called Mount Mahogany. If any of you guys have any access to somebody who lives out west. I'd love to get some out in mahogany. It's not in the mahogany family, but it grows between five and 7,000 feet out west. And in fact, the, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir organ is made from out in mahogany. Yeah. But I've heard a lot of stuff on social, wooden social media that it's wonderful wood to turn. I have, I have yet to do that, and I'd like to. Uh, a lot softer. <laughs> I don't know. It's just they call it Mount mahogany, but it's not in the mahogany family. Oh no! No, no. Okay. So, what about persimmon? Oh, who said persimmon? Persimmon. Yeah. Persimmon. Excellent. Persimmon is what they call Texas ebony or white ebony. Yeah. And persimmon is ebony is I I, I guess I failed that one. Ebony is a uh, Jenga scale is over 3,000, and the persimmon is about 2,300. Matter of fact, his, I, I have a persimmon box right here. I just happen to have a persimmon box. But, but, but this is called, uh, they call this a white ebony or a Texas ebony. Okay. It's in the ebony family. It's a, it is in the ebony family. They use the same Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you see it's got some different colors in there, too. Some blacks and browns and, and light and tans. You don't, find you don't find large ones now because they cut them down in the early uh, 1920s for golf club heads. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what he said, the golf club heads. Yeah. you go to the river bottoms and there's a lot of this Is this back there somewhere? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so. Which is your favorite native wood to use? I'm up there, well, I think three. I think uh, dogwood or Osage orange would be two of my favorites. We, we, they're, they're not readily available, but they're not unreasonable. Some of these hardwoods, I mean, the people call them, they're, they're uh, uranium woods because, or, or uh, gold in, in, uh, injected woods because they, they, so, they cost so much and there's, you know. So, anyway, so there's, there's two woods here. I, I, I just recently saw some uh, a demo by two uh, South American uh, wood threaders. 
Uh, what's his name? Uh, okay, Ironwood is it, it is a nickname for lignum vitae. It what is. is it? Am I right? It's another uh, type of what called ironwood. This okay. Desert, Desert ironwood. D I W. Yeah, I'm not. I don't have that. Up. I don't know that. I mean, uh, all I I can tell you is what I've read. I don't have any, and I haven't ever turned it. It's kind of a each locale, each part of the world has iron woods. We have a desert iron wood in Sonora Desert. You know, okay. we have people call uh, I'll say Dorn iron wood. It's a, kind of a nickname more yeah, than yeah. a one species. Except the desert iron wood is a it. It is a species. Yeah. yeah. I've seen it for knife handles, and I haven't. I, I don't know anybody. I guess they've turned it. I just haven't heard of anybody doing it. I got some I could probably sell you. There's <laughs> always a there's always a business deal going down in there. Um, okay, it's really good. Okay, Cor Corbaccio, the South American. I, I, I've seen two demos here recently by uh, South American turners. And uh, <coughs> yes, sir. Emiliano Arcaba. Yeah, and then it's got and, and, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, And Emilio Archibald. Yeah, and the other one is uh, Maricho Kolonek. The other is Maricho Kolonek. But both of them will add the, these two woods here, I'm getting ready to show you, in their favorites. And look how they're pretty damn hard and they're readily available down in South America, but not here. This is the Corbaccio. The Corbaccio. He said, uh, and you feel how nice these threads, these threads come together and so forth and hold up. But he said that Corbaccio, they, they built a lot of window frames and door frames back in the 20s and 30s down in uh, Argentina and, and so forth. And now, if you go to a deconstruction site, you can grab that stuff and take it home off your bandsaw, and, and it's readily available. But that stuff is like, if you have it shipped up here, it's. You know, that's why they say uranium rich and golden, golden flavor. Okay, what do we got here? Okay, oh, practice material. Now, obviously, you don't want to get some ebony or or Osage orange and stuff in in in, in, in practice with. But let me tell you, it takes a lot of practice. And I'm going to tell you what I found out after over a week. I was frustrated, about ready to sell my tools out here in the auction uh, until I found out what I was doing wrong. And, and I'm going to share that experience with you a little later. Okay. But practice material, number one is a candle. Uh, you get a candle, just mount it up and just practice your, your male thread chasing. It's not going to be pretty, but what you're, what you're, what you're uh, uh, practicing is your, your touch. Your light touch, okay? Get a nice rhythm going with a nice touch. And then you scrape it off and do it again. Candles are cheap, okay? Yeah, they are. <laughs> okay, PVC What's schedule 40. On <laughs> you can get this stuff all day long. Yeah. You probably have some in your garage, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Well, you make threads on it. Practice your thread chasing on that. Oh, hey. Okay? It makes good inserts. It, it does. It does. Okay, how about, uh, oh, Corian. Corian is a countertop material. You can go to, I don't know, a Home Depot and stuff and get stuff. The trouble is it doesn't come in big, thick sheets, you know, thick thicknesses. And I have taken some Corian here, rid of that half inch or thereabouts, yeah. and glued them up together with CA glue. And then you can thread something like this. Feel how nice those hands are. Practice material, guys. What do you glue them up with? You didn't use epoxy? CA glue. Yeah. You want me to spell that for you? No. It <laughs> begins with an M. <laughs> I would have thought they would have pulled loose some plastic. <laughs> okay, the other uh, s s thing I want to mention is 
any, you have, there's a whole bunch of wood out here, and it's hardwood. If you get some of that hardwood on side grain and turn it, it's going to thread, not great, but pretty darn good for practice. Because you've got side grain, end grain, side grain, end grain as, as it's turning. So, let me ask you guys something. This is, this is a side grain, and we're going to go ahead and put it in here, and we're going to get it to round. What tool do we use? What tool would you use? Anybody? Bowl gouge. Okay, why the bowl gouge? Because it's, it's designed for side and end grain. Exactly, exactly. Don't use, I'm trying to get you away from using this. That's a spindle roughing gouge. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, a small piece like this probably won't be catastrophic, but you're still going to get, as the end grain's coming out, it's still going to tear out some end grain on you. The, the trouble is if you have a big piece in its, in its uh, face grain, and that big piece comes around, and you're a little aggressive, and that go gets into that side, into the end grain, you're either going to have two tools or one tool in the wall. Okay? Or in you. Or in you. Correct. That's a little safety tip. Okay, what are you, hardwood side grain? Okay, now, now we're going to talk about alternative materials. Okay, stabilized woods. Now, Sam did a, a great demo here, what, three, four, four or five months ago, thereabouts, yeah. on how he stabilizes his pen blanks. And that's all with cactus juice, which is an impregnated resin, heat activated impregnated resin. And I just want to show you what I've done is something like this. This is, this is a burl, which is relatively soft, but you can feel how, how heavy that is. That's, that's been uh, stabilized, okay? Feel how heavy it is? Pretty heavy. It is heavy. And this is what it, how it turns out when you, when you turn it. Oh, wow. If, look, take a look at the threads. O open that up and take a look at the threads. Now, as a matter of fact, these numbers on here, I think I put, uh, I don't know why I went up, nine, nine uh, grams and it ended with 15. See that? After it was stabilized. You know what that was? I don't. I think it, it I, I want to say maple, but I'm not 100%, Carl. Stabilized wood, a great alternative. Okay, how about segment? Any segmenters here? Segmenters. A little, okay, why are you so ashamed to hold your hand up? Because <laughs> Dennis is here and he doesn't like stable. He doesn't like it. <laughs> he doesn't like it. Okay. Stabilized wood, it takes a lot, a lot of time and effort, a lot of glue and that type thing and wait. But if you do, I do these, this is a piece of stabilized Box, boxes that I've done. I'll do 10 or 12 of these at a time. You put your music on, you, you know, you cut it up and go off and do something else and let it dry up and come in the next day. This is what, that's what I started off with. It, it, it is a lot of work, but then you can get something like this out of there. This, this here is a piece of stabilized, that's yeah. all stabilized. Can you see in there? Yeah. I, I mean, not stabilized, but segment. Yeah, yeah, that's how it starts off. There you go. It's not very attractive. Hey, it's prettier than the ain't it? No, a lot prettier. <laughs> okay. So, st stable, when, you, when you do the segment, you're, you're, you're cutting side grain. Works, works wonderful, except it's time consuming, that's all. So, you have some choices other than getting those seven major woods that I, I referred to earlier. In acrylic, how about acrylic? You know, uh, Sam does acrylic. Acrylic, uh, okay, here's, uh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, did you have to get extra, extra careful when you did acrylic? Really slow? No, no, it's the same. It, it, it actually, what I'm gonna talk about here late, later, is, is the TPI, is the six, I use it 16 TPI, it's kind of the middle of the group. But in acrylics, it's so dense and has no visible growth rings, you're better off going with a 20 TPI. 
it makes a clearer cut. I have not done that. 16 seems to work for me, though. But you, it, it does a good nice Yeah, you're, I'll show you. I'll pass this around. Okay, this this is acrylic that, that's come out of the mold with some uh, burl in there, and I'll turn that and make one of these out of it. Okay, how about ivory? You want to go kill a walrus or no, a whale? Whale. Here's what they call imitation I ivory. As a matter of fact, uh, who, who's going to do the scrimshaw demo next? Rich. 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 Rich yeah. He put, he put me on this. I was asking him about it. That's imitation ivory. Look how pretty that is. And that is, there's no finish on that. That's just uh, buffed up with a, uh, some uh, resin of uh, onyx. How expensive is that? I'm sorry? How expensive is that stuff? This one piece what came out to here, I think, was $30. That's not bad. So no, not for you, Carl. You, I've seen all your money. <laughs> yeah. Is it synthetic? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. And it's it's probably a secret formula. I'm sure they do a resin or an acrylic and resin, and then they impregnate it with some bone dust or something. So don't leave your old false teeth around in it. <laughs> it's kept it's burl always from the root of a tree. No. A, a, a dentist will exp explain this better than I can. Burl it comes off the side of the tree. It's a, a fungus, would you say, or th they no, don't it's, know? It's, it's more virus. Virus, yeah. It irritates and the wood. And if you don't, don't have point, the book, it grows from there. What, what's that? What, if you don't have the book entitled "The Soul of a Tree," I've seen that. By Nor George Nakashima. <clears throat> yeah. It is beautiful. I've seen it. I have it at home. Yeah. Yeah. He does mostly uh, slab. Uh, tables, and yeah. that type of stuff, yeah. Beautiful. Okay, okay that's it. What about uh, I have not done that. I'm sure. I, 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 bet they, I bet they would turn nice. Yeah, I have not done it. Uh, so it's another little talk session, but I'm gonna t what I'm going to talk about now is the tools we use and some of the ancillary tools. That's a big word, isn't it? Ancillary. Number one is, is thread chasers. Thread chasers are come in a package like this, and there's 20 TPI, 18, 16, 12, and 10, I think it is. The course of the the the, the course of the TPI, uh, the faster you have to move the tool, and it and it's also the course of wood. If you go into something like like. Uh, Acrylic or, or, or plastic, you turn a PVC, you're better off turning with a 20 TPI. Everything I've done is with a 16 TPI. And it's kind of the middle of the goal. Everyone says you start off with that, practice with that. Now, there's a lot of companies that sell thread chasers Robert Sorry, Sorby, Ashley Isles, Kraft, name another one. Just, there's a lot of them out there. But they'll come in a package like this, okay? And right out of the package, what I want you to notice is the first thread. The first thread, well, first of all, there's a male and a female, or an outside and an inside. This is the female. Can you see that? This is the female thread chaser right here. Go ahead. And this is the male. The first thread on the male is this right here, because that's the lead tooth. Can you see that right here? Oh, yeah, it's right there. The first thread on the female is, is right there. That's the lead tooth. The, the number one thing you have to keep in mind is that lead tooth has to be whole, has to be complete. Let, take, a, take a look at what, what you see in there right now. Is that complete? It's a little nub of about a quarter of a thread there, isn't it? Huh? You've got to clean that up before you ever want to use it. So you've got to take it to the grinder and grind that, grind that so you at least you have a full lead tooth. Because once you're inside 
or outside the matter. And you have your threads established, and you get a nice rhythm going, and you start rotating this handle around, the lead tooth is going to, is what it's going to do, it's going to lead, and that's doing most of the cutting, once you've got some of those other threads. So it, it, describe what you mean by grinding. You know, you OK, you take it to the grinder and just Right off the first one? No, no, no that, that quarter, of, that little nib there. Can you see the nib right here? Here, draw, draw it off these paper things. Yeah. I don't think they, they, they can't see it from. I'm going to pass it around. So you got. And there's a little nib right there. See that there? Yeah. So what we're going to do is take it, to, I'm not going to do it now, but take it, you want to take it to the grinder and grind that off so you have a full, full tooth. So basically you want the peak and the first part of the valley. Yes, correct. The other thing too is if you notice, if you slide your hand along the side here, it's very sharp. You need to take that to the grinder and, and grind that off in a nice little radius. Make it nice and smooth, okay? Now, I've done something to mine that's a little different than these. I've modified mine. And the reason is, I'll show you here in a minute. Can you see? The, let's put the two males together. Oh, let me, let me, let me get this right out of here, Bob. You can't zoom that. Bob. This is mine. This is my. Well, I, how I, I have modified it, and this is, comes out of the factory right there. Can you see the difference? What did I do? <laughs> I've made it, they call it a, whale, a whale's tail. Okay? When you keep, and the reason is, what's going to hurt you more than anything when you're chasing threads, whether it be male or female, you have a, you're coming in, you have a shoulder here. And then everything's nice and cool, and, and if this tool were to hit that shoulder, remember it's these, these threads are, are in the, the rope which you've already made, and it's rotating at 350 degree, 350 RPMs. It's going to be pushed up against that shoulder, and it's going to tear all those threads you just made out. So what you want to do, what, what, what I do, and I'll show you something else here in just a second. I cut that back, and I always, it might give me a micro, microsecond of warning so I can come along and pull it out before it hits that shoulder. Now, if you notice, now first of all, all these turning tools, these are approximately, don't hold me to this, about $80, $90 roughly for a set of just these two tools. And there's some other things that will go with it I'll talk about. Carter and Son makes this. It's a male and female on the same unit. And the male, if you notice the male, he's, they've already got that, allowed for that to give you some act. As the lead tooth is coming along, it gives you a little bit of extra time because of that little curve there to pull out. Okay? Female, the female threads, what I have done is, this is, comes out of the factory right here. But as you see what I did, is I have, I have ground it back. <laughs> okay, get no respect. <laughs> what I've done, I'm going to just draw this on here. I've taken that away. See that? I've taken that away. And the reason is, it also gives me a little excess time once I'm in there to pull it out. And it also allows me to get into something that's a little narrower, a hole that's a little narrower. Okay? So what I'm going to do is, let me just pass these, I want to keep these up here. I'm going to pass these around. And by, and by the way, on the cardo and son, if you're in, into, the, into the internal female, you see how he's got, they've got that arced back? Yeah. That's a little advantageous to you as well, because it's enabling you to pull out. Follow me? So let me pass these around. Yes, these are these were designed by Mike Mahoney, but they're, they're made by Carter and Son. And it's really I've I have I've only used this on a couple little items and it, it seems to work really well. Okay? 
Mike is real big on uh, double-ended tools yeah. of all kinds, and that's his design. Well, you use that one? Yeah. When I use hand tracing, mostly I use a jig. You, you see, you, did everyone hear what Dennis said he uses a jig, a threading jig? The advantage of a thread, and I have one too, and Mike, you got one, who else has one? Two, a couple. Of, the advantage of that is you can turn about anything. You can thread, I mean thread about anything on a, on a threading jig, but not hand chasing. You only can do the woods that I was showing you. You got it? Okay, uh, the other thing I want to t show you is this. This is called an arm brace. No, I love this thing. I love this thing, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Get out of sight. <laughs> I love this heckler, by the way. You, by the way, remember the, the Muppet show? There's two hecklers up in the balcony. You, anybody know their names? Statler. Statler. They moved after hotels in, Rush, in uh, New York. I used to love watching them. <laughs> Either one. We're going to play with this in just a minute, but I just want to give you a brief explanation of what this is. This is an arm brace, and by the way, I also round off these corners to keep it smooth. Now, another thing you want to think about, I might as well talk about this now, when coming to the lathe, adjust the lathe, and make sure that this tool rest is completely nice and smooth and no nick on it. As soon as you come across here and you hesitate or hit a nick, it's going to show up in the work. So what I'll do is I just take a piece of uh, Steel wool, just make sure it's all nice and clean. And just shoe polish, neutral shoe polish. Put it on here and, and uh, kind of gives it a nice slick. Like slick as dear guts on the doorknob. So, so the, this arm brace, the arm brace is such that it's used with the female threads. And what you do is, is, is come up under it, hold it, and you, you work in this way. Now, why I like the arm brace is because I've got this tool rust at a 45 degree angle and I have complete access to the inside of that. And they also, when I'm, I'm chasing them down to the end, when I said you don't want to get that, this tool at the, back, uh, show, at the back wall, just before it hits there, all I got to do is release my fingers and it's going to come out. See, so I'm, I'm slightly pulling it back to me, release my fingers and come out. I don't, now, you don't have to have that tool. I, I know Dennis is in his backyard. We're going to go over and dig it up. But you don't have to have it, but you'll be doing this, and you don't have complete access to it. Okay? Does that make sense? Again, you don't have to have this tool, but I like it. I think if you start playing with it. But if if you if you weren't using that, you'd still be using two hands. Well, you have a, a one motion. I'm not complicated enough to use that. <laughs> okay. I, don't, I think I just cut mine up. And use <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think I ground a coin on it or something. I, I like it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and, okay. And it's just used on the female threading. And, and like I said, the, re the reason for that is back in the old days, so it's back when Jeff was in high school, they had a, a one big round tool bar, a tool rest, and it wasn't movable where you could move it 90 degrees. So to, so to get at the end, they came up with this idea. We don't have to get another tool rest. We'll just go ahead and work our tools off, off of the arm rest. Does that make sense? Okay, another... Um, Okay, another thing, I'm going to, some of these tools uh, I brought 
of for basically I'm making little boxes. And I'm not going to take them out and show you how what I do until um, I come to that, that point in my talk. The other thing I failed to, to talk, talk to you about is the sharpening of, of these uh, tools. Let me talk to that, talk to you about in just a second here. I'm going to go to the grinder. If you notice, wait a minute, let me just show you on the overhead. Can you see that little area here that's that's ground off? You see that? That's a negative lake. Basically, this is a profiled negative lake scraper. And I've intentionally ground that down. For those of you who don't know about a negative lake scraper, it's kind of a, not the new thing, but it's, it's a wonderful thought, whoever came up with that, that it's not as aggressive as a regular flat scraper. The, the, the original tools going around has a flat surface on it. There's one, one of the, I can't remember which South American turner, he, he, he liked to turn this flat. He'd put a piece of 320 sandpaper here and just turn it like that. That's, I like to have a little bit of a negative rake on it. And how I, I do a negative rake, by the way, when you come up to a, a grinder, I'm not going to turn it on. When you come up to a grinder, wear your safety glasses. There's a lot of stuff that could be kicked out of there. Uh, on, the, on the female one, get this as close to the wheel as possible. Make sure it, it can't drop down between there. And just come up into this position. You get it heel and just rotate it to you. To you just see, see it touching the, the tip, and, then you've, and that, that's all there is to it. On the nail, you can take out this arm bar. I don't think this goes out long enough. And just touch it up that way. By the way, sometimes it helps if you take, I use a red Sharpie on here. And, and just by hand, you can tell if, it, if you're in the right ballpark or not. And that helps. Um, Okay, I'm going to kick, kick somebody with this thing. Uh, okay, I'm going to get into this in just a second, but this is an interesting tool. I'm going to call this my Rodney Dangerfield tool, because it, no, it, it gets no respect. It's my three-point tool. In a three-point tool, can you see that? Go in the overhead. Here we go. One, two, three. I've used hardened steel. I know some guys will take a screwdriver and put it in the, the V arm and grind through. If you do this by hand, you're going to have more facets on this than the space shuttle has heat tiles. So uh, to stabilize it, what I have done is something like this. You see that? It's an equilateral triangle. Find your center, and you can go up to the platform with this flat, lay it down, come up, rotate it this way, this way, this way. Okay? Now you got three. <laughs> I'm trying to get you guys to spend money. <laughs> Okay, another one. Another way. I'm going to pass this around. Another option. I, I saw. I, I don't take credit for this, guys, because uh, I'm not that smart. What the guys do is they take. This is a. What are the two most common threads uh, uh, in the in the country? Is quarter twenty and three eight sixteen, correct? Right. This is a three eight sixteen. Just so happens that the in inside diameter is five sixteenths. Okay. So this is a 5 sixteenths rod, and I put two uh, uh, nuts, hex nuts on there, and put super, not super glue, uh, what do you call it, hot waxed on it to stabilize it. Hot glue, not hot wax, hot glue. So I can lay that on the platform. A hex head nut has got six sides. I need every other side, so I just go over the other side, and I can get a three point. So I make, here's the first one. Me. Take that. Another way you can do it, this is called a 
uh, what is this called? A union boat? Yeah. Okay. But again, a three eighths. So the five sixteenths shaft will stick through here, and I tapped it with a little a little uh, Allen screw, and now boom, 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 and you get the three sides. Okay. Now, uh, what can I show you? Uh, Dennis, <laughs> uh, I got those for, what's that uh, metal company, MS, M, three dollars, M, MSC, yeah, I get it from them, it's hardened steel, I don't know, yeah, like I, t I think I told, mentioned that I've seen some guys take a screwdriver, put it in the VM and lay it down by eye, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize, recommend that, but, but the, I'm, I want to tell you, this, this 3.2 this three point two is really, I, I use it a lot, it's all for detail work. You can make real small beads with it. I'll, I, I can do that here in just a second. Here, matter of fact, I'll... Why, why do you do hand chasing instead of jig? I don't know. <laughs> Well, if, if my, I think if I were to do just one or two little boxes, I could do it faster with hand ch chasing. However, there's a lot of time to get to that point. A, a lot of experience and a lot of effort. You can, cha you can cut and hold threads in just about anything with a, with a threading jig. It's, to me, it's just fun. Plus, the threading jigs are up at the $500 mark, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, De Dennis actually gave a demo years ago on how to make one out uh, of just spare parts. So. Yeah. Well, for him, it yeah. Yeah. I turn with a one uh, eight thread chuck, so I go from a mini lay to my threading jig. So with that process, I do uh, shape it, then I thread it, and so I can put out a threaded bottom on say my eight point almost. Without thinking, really yeah, if you get the, it's all set up for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier with a threading jig. I've made yeah. a thousand of those. Eight yeah. Okay. So now. Let's go ahead and, and start playing a little bit. Let me give you some forethought, forethought on this. There's two ways that I can hollow this out. And I'm leaning to this, the second way after I tell you. I can get into that, and you all know about this, when you take a spindle gouge, you, 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 pull it, you push it in like it's a drilling bit, and then just drag it out and enlarge the hole, correct? You know how to do that, right? I've been doing something just a little bit different. I've been taking a uh, forcing a bit. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages on both these methods I'm getting ready to tell you. A forcing a bit, let me get this out. Ooh, there it goes. I'll do a forcing a bit, drive it in. The downside to this is it's got a little, um, with that point went in, what you call it, a div divot? And you're going to get rid of that at some point. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, however, the advantage is that these have parallel sides. And that's really what you're looking for is parallel sides. Okay? So let me go ahead. In fact, I haven't even turned this on yet. I guess we've got electricity. I'm going to see what three. But I think I talked to you a little bit about the TPIs, but the speed on this is critical too. They say you can chase between 150 and 500. The sweet spot for me is between 300 and 350, right in that range. I don't have a, a digital readout on my lathe. I, it says when you're in the number one position uh, on the potentiometer, it's, it's 390, so I go just below that. But you hit, does anybody here have no 
uh, digital readouts in your life. Okay. There's another thing you can do is you can you can buy for twenty eight dollars a radar. It's like a radar gun, and you put a little piece of tape on one of your, your rotating parts, and it'll give you. And you say, oh, that's between a two and a three, and then you just put a mark on your lathe it, it, for three fifty. Let's say you want three fifty. Okay. Okay. And I'm just going to get this into about the thickness. I could go faster. And I'll just go, this is, I'm not going to do a full box here. We, we, we got quarter of 11, yeah, I, I'm okay. What you're going to do here to, is the idea here is to get these sides parallel, and they pretty much are parallel because we used the force in a bit. But now we got to get rid of the, see that little divot in it? Is it called a divot or a divot? Never have got that figured out. What kind of wood is that, Chip? Uh, that's dogwood. I have this tool here. As a matter of fact, I might as well talk about this all the time. Oh, these two tools as well. This tool here, it's like a small radius, but I put a negative like scraper, scraper profile on it. And this one here is for the, to, if you were to get a, one of the bottom of your box to be nice and square and, and, and 90 degrees to the sides, you would use something like this. Let me talk about this for a minute. I'll go in here and do this. Uh, all my negative like scrapers, they say an effective negative like scraper should be the included angle, meaning this angle plus that angle, should be roughly 70 to 80 degrees. In other words, it's going to be less than 90. Okay, that's what makes it effective. So all of mine, I put a 20 degrees to the top and a 60 degrees to the relief, and it comes out to be an 80. I mean, it's real simple. It doesn't have to be that way. You could do 25 and I don't know, whatever. Now this one here is a box scraper, or what they call an inside tool. You got a move ahead on that? Yeah. To notice the profile on that. I've, it's angled, and it, but this angle here is more than 90. It's, in order, that's to get into the corner without it scraping the bottom. You could come in this way, or you could tilt it this way and come across and get into that corner. But also notice, look at the profile. Can you see that? That's the 60 in the, in the, so all of these tools I'm showing you, that, that's kind of what I do. But let me show you how I do it. And again, go look for your safety glasses, because we're going to go to a grinder. One of the, one of the things uh, you'll realize when you buy the Wolverine system is this platform is kind of junky. It's not fully protect you if you get the Stuart Bradley has a nice one that has it comes up around the, the wheel. Are you, are you guys familiar with the Stuart Bradley one? If you don't, look, do this. See this piece of plywood or profile plywood? It'll come up around the the cutting surface and you can and double stick tape it onto your a platform. Now when you get to do this you have to be over here, here to do that profile, and you're rotating around and you come up over here. You don't want a space, a big space, between the wheel and the tool or your fingers. Okay? So that's a real simple solution right here. And the same thing with this. Oh, it has to come in this side. Okay? You got the, those little wings mean a lot. So we don't need to go back there anymore, but let's get rid of that little divot in the middle. Everybody with me so far? Eight hundred and so forth, that's pretty cool. Get, you in you get you in here? Can you see this? I 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to work it out, but you get the, you're going to get the idea. Now, what, what, what's it doing? I, I've got a nice 90 degrees flat bottom, but really what I'm doing, see those nice shavings you're getting over there? I'm taking that divot out of there, but I'm making a slight uh, concave surface too. It's going to be in the top of the box. Okay, now I can work on that a little more. That's good enough for now. Now when you want to, before you thread, uh, and you want that bottom cleaned out, now's a good time to do some sanding in there. Now what you want to do is you're going to make that, re remember I told you that uh, recess, that you pull your tool out before it hits the wall? This is what I'm going to make it with. Overhead. Can you see the profile on that? Let me get uh, let me get a background. Can you see the profile? Huh? Now I've cut this, and I can pass this around later. I've cut. Matter of fact, if you think about making these. You don't have to. I'm going to show you some other alternative methods, but you can go ahead and just trace this on a piece of paper. I cut it back, and that's about, I don't know. Is that any better? But you can see the profile. But if you also look, I've got the, this edge here angled back, so roughly that 60 degree I was talking about. This edge here is rough, rough back, and this edge. So see the, see the front end view of that? Can you see that? See that? Okay, so now, now what we're going to do is cut a reveal in here. Uh, it doesn't have to be that tool. I'm going to show you something else. It could be as simple as a, ho a mini hollowing tool. You've all got those? I'm sure you do in your arsenal. Okay, that's what you can use. Or what some guys do is use, use a uh, Allen wrench. And they profile the top slightly down, and you can see the, the, the profile. I'm going to pass this around. See that? And that works as well. So you don't really need one of these tools. I've just had this forever. I'm trying to get you guys to buy some stuff. Here. OK, so let's go ahead and, and uh, we're going to put a, a color reveal in here. Get, get this camera. I got them from uh, one of the attorneys at John C. Campbell, and, and I, I, I'd like to get some more, to be honest with you. And he, I think he was out of Atlanta. I got one from this couple of years ago. I'd like to ask Yeah. If you would make your own handles, and I like making handles, so, you know. Okay. Are you in here? Okay, I'm, all I'm going to do is go to the back, touch it. Let's, let's stop it here. That's, I probably need a little deeper than that. Can you see that down in there? Okay, I'm going to make it a little deeper. Okay, see that? Now, this is where that three-point tool comes in. They say what you need to do is soften the, 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 ed, the ed, edge. You need to soften it. There's two ways to soften it. And I'm going to tell you the advantage and what I learned. One is the, to do a chamfer. To me, a chamfer is taking a 90 degree angle and making 245s out of it, right? Or you round off the edge. I did the chamfer, the 45 degree for a while until I was getting some bad results. And what I learned was that I was coming in and touching, just touching one of those 45s, maybe too aggressively, and it was hesitating. The tool was hesitating just enough to make a little wiggle 
in the, in the uh, throat. I had one that had a lot of wiggles in the throat. You know what they call those? They call them drunken throats. I called Jeff one day. I said, Jeff, why am I getting all these drunken throats? He says, because you're turning right after happy hour. So, No, I still do. <laughs> but the, the, to me, the secret is to just barely, uh, I mean, to, to round it over, and when you go in with a thread chaser, which I will here in a second, is to just barely touch that wood, scraping, do they call it, uh, yeah, scraping the wood. Anyways, so let's go ahead and, and uh, I'm just around in the corner off. I don't know, what is that, maybe an eighth of an inch round? See the nice shavings you're getting off of that? Let me show, let me show you something else. It's, I'm telling you, you're going to, make, you're going to use this 3.2 a lot. Just remember, when you use it on the side, use it in a trailing position. That is, with, with the, the, the handle is higher than the tool point, because you'll never get, you won't get a catch that way. If you have it down here and it catches, it could be nasty. Okay, so watch watch the surface here. Yep, yep here. Yeah. I'm shearing it. Look at that. See the shavings? That's dogwood. Anybody want to come up and look at that that edge there and see if I need to sand it around? It's pretty smooth. I say, well, it's second and dear got some doing up. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and try some female threading, chasing, not threading, chasing. Oh, okay, this, I know, oh, here it is. One of the things that I will always do is I always use one of these honing stones. Uh, you, you don't really need one, but I do. Uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's pretty handy. Uh, Mike Mahoney and I think... Somebody else I can't remember. They just put sandpaper up here on a nice flat surface, and that's how they do it. I have one that's made by, who's the guy in Atlanta uh, that does all the CBM wheels? Uh, uh, what's his name? Kim. Rizzo. Yeah. Uh, this is where I got this from. I don't remember what this was, but one side is 600, and the other side is 350. And I'll just, you overhead? Try to get this. Okay. We're, oh, back here. Oh, I have to come out here. Okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm sighting down this and seeing if that's it's on that flat surface. And all I do is just a little bit of rubby, rubby, dubby, dubby. And you can tell by maybe a little bit of shine going on there on that down slope that top part of the negative like scraper. Remember, these are, these are nothing more than a profile negative like scraper. Now, I will, now here's, a, here's a tool that you guys are not going to believe how, how cheap this tool is. Okay? D yeah. Just remember, you want to put it back in the ca cabin before your wife finds out. I, without, this is, this is Dr. Scratch free wood turning, polishing wax. It's just, all of this is soft wax. You can make that up with beeswax and, and mineral, mineral oil, a mixture of yourself or buy it. I like it. Uh, and the, the question always becomes, why don't you use CA glue to, to stiffen up those threads? I don't like using CA glue. And this is only me talking. Other people have had success with it. CA glue, to me, uh, tends to dull the tool quicker. And first of all, you never want to spritz it with accelerator after you put it on, because it, it will make it crumbly. And then if you sit and wait for the allotted time for that CA glue to, to heal, so to speak, uh, and if, you, if you're a little aggressive and, and, and you don't time it right, you get in there and you get a little CA glue on the, on the thread chaser, you got a little problem going on. It's not going to make pretty threads. So that's why I don't use it. I use this, and this works out pretty good. I'll put it on a couple times. Now, I'm getting ready to tell you something that, I'm sorry? Almost like wet sand. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'm going to tell you something that's the just if I if you get to come away with these two things, I'm going to tell you one of them right now. You're going to save a lot of time. I when I was learning how to chase threads, I, I bet I spent a week and a half, maybe even close to two weeks, every day doing two or three of these type things. And sometimes I was successful, and other times I wasn't. I couldn't figure it out. I'd screw the lid on, and it was it, it wouldn't line up face to face. Or it was too tight, and, and it too tight, and I'd go to loosen it up. By, 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 by trimming down the threads, and all of a sudden now it's way too loose. Couldn't figure it out. What it was it, is I was going too fast. Remember, you have a 350 degree spin on the, on the lathe, and you have a feed rate, and they have to be harmonized. So if, if, if I think about this, I, I think I can do this in front of an audience, uh, but I have to slow down. And what's happened, if I don't, I'm going to get what's called a double thread. You ever heard of that? Anybody? No? Let me just show you. Uh, where is it? Um, no, I'm not making it up. I, I guess I don't have it here. It was in that box. I saw it earlier. A double thread? I remember. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Got it. This, this camera, look down in here if you would. How I discovered that is if you take a real sharp pencil and you come in into that thread and you rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, and it comes all the way around, and wait a minute, there's one thread between those two pencil marks. Do you see what I just did? Okay, and after I after I did that, I said, "Holy crap! What a waste of time! A week and a half trying to figure that out." But that's I, I want to, and, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attempt to make some female threads, and attempt to make sure that they're single threads, not double. And if they are double, then I'll just go further into the wood and, and do another one. And I have more wood here to play with too, so in case you guys don't think. <laughs> Okay, so look, we're going to take this at, a, at about a 45, roughly. Oh, what happened there? The, uh, I want this to be slightly high. Uh, in other words, I'd like the bottom of this chaser to be at center height. And uh, maybe a little higher. The, the nice thing here, it, oh gosh. That's not nice. That's right at the end, isn't it? Did we get another one of those? One of the nice things, I know Dennis was poo poo in the sound brace, but to me one of the nice things is all of this is, do all of this is done by feel. See if that's not. No, that's not going to, is that going to work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's get some. It's got some bumps on there. It, all of this is done by feel. Um, and and you, you could move this tool ever so slightly up or down without having to move the tool rest. And it's all done by feel. So let's go ahead. I'm going to turn the speed down to where I think is about 350. I wonder what happened here. Oh, there we go. I got it. That's, that should be close enough. Okay, we're going to come around. I got the tool. Let's see, it, it may have to come up a little bit. I'm going to get a rhythm going. 1,001, 1,002, 1, I'm coming in, rotating, and coming up. And when I'm going to start, I'm going to start scratching with a second or third tooth, not the first tooth. A very light touch, and then I'm going to push it in to try to get a, a, a few more behind it. So let's try this. Hear it? 
Okay, now I'm, I'm starting to get a spiral in there. I'm still going right. Let me stop it and let you look. Can you see that little spiral starting? Again, I hope I, if I'm going too fast, it's going to be a double thread. I'll have to deal with that. Okay, lightly, 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 and okay, lightly. You see the nice little curls coming off of that? That means the tool's sharp. You see that? See those little curls right there? And, and what I'm doing now, I'm starting to rotate this tool up so that this cutting surface is going to be parallel to the lathe. And as I come up, I'm pretty well full on most of those, those threads. I'm now cutting with the lead tooth. The lead tooth is doing the cutting. Okay, before I go any further, let's see if I've got a double thread. See that? I'm going to move it. That came in the same. Hang on for a minute. Holy shit. Let, let, let me clean that up. I, it looks like it's going in the same. If it comes in the same, it's a bead, not a, not a thread. And as you come around, you're going to feel this thing pulling this tool in. You see, and you see me going to the to the end, end just before that that wall, and I'm, I'm just releasing my my hand, and it's it's coming out. So those nice shavings. Let's see what we got here. There we go. You see those two? See the the two uh, pencil marks? They're right together. That means it's a single. So I did something right in the first one. I still got one more to go. Okay. And what I'm looking for now is it's, sometimes it's hard for me to see with these bad eyes. I'm looking down in there. I want to get those threads. A normal thread is, is, is positioned like this and, and pointed at the top. I'm looking for almost that. In other words, I don't want them pointed at the top. I'm pretty darn close. About 80% form, something like that. You guys having fun yet? It, it sometimes jams, but it, more, more often it will crumble. It doesn't hold up well. Now, see, I can, you can cut all the threads you want, but if it doesn't hold up over time, it's not worth it. You know? Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So the new shavings coming up. That's, this is a box, oh, in the dogwood. And you can tell it's dogwood because of the bark. <sighs> Maybe a little more. Buddy and I used to tell that all the time. And I heard that, I mean, twice a year for years. <laughs> if you're using a jig, do you still have to maintain that slow speed? On the laser no, no. Uh, what's, what, on the jig, the cutter head is spinning at pretty fast rate. It could be a thousand RPM. That's a cutter. And what you're, you're back here cranking, and you're cranking at 16 TPI, if that's the TPI. You, you, and you crank in, and it goes in, and then you, then you, I stop it and pull it out, and then, then crank a little more, and, 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 and that. So you run the lathe faster. Yes, yes, correct. The way, I don't know, somewhere around 15, 1800, 2000, somewhere in the damage. Is that right? No, the, the, the lathe. He's asking about the, 
the lathe speed on a on threading jig. Okay, you, what you're doing is you're spinning the, the cutter head. head. Yeah, yeah, and then you're, you're, you're feeding it with a crank. Yeah. You're turning it. Slowly. Yeah, yeah, hand, hand uh, pulling it. Okay, so let's just, I think that I need a, I think I need a little bit more on that. Now, one of the things I didn't do is I didn't check the parallel, which is really important, but I assume it's parallel because I used the force in a bit, correct? Is that right? I hear me, man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'd get a look. I still have to go maybe a little bit more. Now, there's a lot of patience involved in this. You guys, so you guys are real patient with me. Appreciate it, brother. Appreciate it. Okay. I think we're going to be able to get this done. Okay. Uh, you hear that sound? You know when you hit the back wall, because they'll go <laughs> No. All those, all those shit, yeah, they, that, I'd say that's pretty well developed. Now, let me just, let me just uh, run something by it that we, that we didn't do, because we assumed that that was parallel. We want to go ahead and make sure if we had if we had just used the uh, the inside tool and and, 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 and said we need to get, get this parallel. What, what, what's ugly to thread chasing is if you have if you have a taper, it doesn't work well. It, it'll start binding and all that other stuff. So you need the inside here as as parallel as can be. So how we do that? I'm glad you asked. If I can find some tools is, oh, here it is, here it is. This has to be a number two pencil on sharpen. It has to be, number ones don't work. So you put them in here, you press against that facet. Are you overhead? Does that look like it's parallel to the, it looks like what? It looks like, Okay, it looks like I have to cut off a little bit more in the back, doesn't it? Is that right? Okay, let's do it. Uh, by the way, uh, there, there are other methods too. I've seen some people use, I don't know, an Allen wrench, you know, put an Allen wrench up in there, into the back. Uh, and, and I haven't talked about this here, and I, I will in a minute. They've taken these and looked down and then you can see, see if they're parallel which it does. It looks like the back is a little bit narrower. So let's take a little off the back because we want to make this precise. <sighs> Basically, I'm coming in about halfway in. And I'm cutting the back. I'm kind of avoiding the front to so let's try it again. Does that look any better? Much better. Okay. Let's call it a let's call it a wrap up. Now, obviously, I'm not making a box because I would a box I would have a ten in one end, ten in another. Cut it, you know, one thirds, two thirds kind of thing to make it. I'm just doing this for for practice. And for, and for entertainment for you guys. You think I like doing this by myself? No. I'm going to come out here and play. With this, I've got one of these Baxter cutoff tools. This thing's a wonderful, by the way, if you haven't got one. Uh, i got to make sure I'm going to... That's about where the bottom is. And that's about where I'm going to cut it, right there. So, let's turn them on. 
The one thing you'll find out, though, if you're doing th uh, hand chasing threads, you, you go between a, 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 a turning speed, which is fast, back to your th threading speed, which is slow. Don't even forget that. <laughs> so let's go. Oh, that's not where I want to do this. And all I'm going to do is just cut this out. By the way, by the way, my apologies. I should be wearing a face shield. No one called me on that. Take that off. Okay. I've never done that. You didn't get the, you didn't get that on film, did you? <laughs> Unfortunately, I need this piece up here now, but later on, if you want, you can come up and take a look at these threads. They look, they look okay to you? Pretty good. Look pretty good? Uh, okay, now we're, what we're going to do is we're going to measure, because we, we have to get a, uh, a nail that's going to screw into here. Now, let me tell you a couple ways to do this. Um, Alan Batty, what he'll do, is, I think it was interesting, and these, these guys are, are really pros at this, and they do this all the time. Overhead. Shield off. If this is the piece we have on here now, and we're going we're gonna to make a, a male thread, what, what Alan does is he, come, he brings it down, it, to send it near, near it, and then on this end, it's square. Do you see what I just did there? So, so this end here, this, this skinny end here, this, this would fit in, just barely fit in. So this is the top of the females, which is going to be the bottom of the males. So then what he'll do is he eyeballs it and just withers this one down to right about there, right about there. And then he, he chases threads in here until he sees a witness mark on the small one. And he says, okay, I've got it. Damn if it doesn't work. Mike Mahoney does something different. And he'll take here and then he, he angles it down, angles it down. And he puts this on here to get a rub going. And let's just say the rub is right there. Then he says, okay, I bought it. And he takes it up a few notches. And he, then he turns this cylinder down, the spigot down to that. And he starts chasing threads. Got it? There's a lot of ways to do it. I'm going to give you a couple more. <laughs> this is what I do. Well, this is what I have done, but I've got something different now. I know by hand uh, threading, threading machines, when I did that, I would add one thousandths of an inch. Do, do, what do you do? No, I'm, okay, I do 50,000, so, and together they're 100. And, and, but that still gives me some leeway to, to you know, to... Adjust it. That's 16 threads per yeah. inch is about 35, 37,000. Okay. Difference from height. 18 threads per inch is more like an 8. Yes, correct. So what, what I used to do, is, or I can do, still do, 
is I'll take the diameter of the female, and the, let, me, let me do that again, hang on. There, and I'll add a th 100,000, which is right about there, and I'll lock it. Wait a minute. I'm moving this around too much. I'll lock it, and then I will go, turn the cylinder down to that and work, work that. Another way to do it, and this, this is a, a, a gauge that Robert Sorby sells with, and I think these are about $40, and I think the, the, the fairly well worth it. Overhead. You put these two, uh, if you get, oh, that's not, that's not it. What am I doing with that? If you put these two indicators in here, open them up to get get it a nice snug fit, uh, and lock it down. I get up, I don't know if you guys notice, I shake that right hand a little bit. I had my shoulder replaced about a year ago, and, and I get these three fingers are still numb, uh, or somewhat numb, they tingly. So sometimes I'm not getting a good feel. Okay, I just locked that in. Can you see that over here? Okay, see that? I can also tell by what I just did if these threads are parallel, too. That's another way to do it. See them going in there? They look pretty reasonable. Okay, you have, a, you have an indicator here, or I don't know what that's called, but I put it at 16. What is 16? <laughs> it's uh, I can't even see that. Bob, get 16, uh, Mark, uh, get 16 on there for me. It was on 16? Yeah. Okay, good. Now remember, uh, this is, uh, and, I, and I like this, I, I tend to use this more and more. But remember, I, I did it my old-fashioned way in this way. I'm willing to bet that they're real close. Oh, I mean. No, that's not right. I'm doing... Oh. I moved it. Okay, hang on. I'm going to get it right. But my point is, this is another way to do it. And I like this method, and I'll show you why when I get turning it. Is it real close? Oh, it's this way. Okay. Real close. Um, and what I'll do is I'll turn a metal tenon down and I'll use this as a sizer. Okay? Okay, so let's do this and we'll take out a tool, another tool called the badan. Okay? It doesn't look like a badan, does it? The difference is that this is an English grind, two facets on the on a piece of square metal as a badan to the English, and the French only have one. That's why we always, you saw that one I had earlier. Uh, right. uh, this one right here, that's a one facet. That's a French grind, this is the English grind. This is another invaluable tool I use a lot for boxes. And what we're gonna do, huh? It, yes, exactly. Yeah, but except it's probably got a 50 degree inclined angle. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, a uh, they call a peeling cut. A peeling cut. We still all have the same principles as a normal cut. We remember the three ABCs of cutting anchor bevel cut. I'm gonna anchor it. I'm gonna put the bevel rub the bevel, and then to get the cut, I'm gonna raise it, raise the handle slightly, and the top surface of that is going to come around and peel off like an apple core. However, I can't keep it there because it's get, the diameter is getting smaller. So what I have to do is I have to arc it in like that. Arc it in toward the middle. 
Okay? Let me put it down here a little bit. Let's see what happens. Anchor, bevel, cut. See how nice that comes off? But now I have to go down to this size. A lot more, I know that, but let's go down to... Again, this takes a lot, little bit of patience. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to really stop just before I get there to make sure I don't have any double threads. And then if I don't, then I can continue. So I'm real cl I'm kind of close. Let me go. Okay. I I've got that just a little bit proud. And now what I want to do is make a recess. You remember how I made the recess in the inside with the with that tool that went in and arced in? I have to make a, I really have to make a recess here, and I do that with my parting tool. They say that to, to make a good recess, you, you want at least the width, the width of your your thread, and the width of my thread was sixteenths because it's one six sixteen to one. Now, the mark of a good craftsman they say, and I'm not there yet, is, is to have a, a, almost no visible relief and no visible entry. Now, I can control the entry because I can take off some threads later. But the, in the relief, I'm going to use this. But what some guys will do is they'll actually take the point tool and go in there, and the, the relief is that point, and the point blends in with the threads as it comes up to that. So it's like, hey, I'm, there's no relief in there. I don't mind the relief. So I'm just going to come in here like this, whatever that takes. Now I'm going to use the three-point tool. And I can sure cut this from this side right here. Now the next question is, am I making a concave? Like you would a friction fit box? I don't. I make them flat to go, to, to go together. I suppose you could, but I don't. I just make them flat. And I'm going to round up. Remember I said we don't want the, I don't want the uh, bevel or the, the chamfer. I like a rounded edge. So it's as easy as that. Okay. Now we're going to go back to chasing speed. Which seems a little touchy. There. I'd say that's good enough. So now we take out our mirror chaser. If it's if I can find it. And here it is. And I always, like I say, start off with a little bit of a horn. Let me shut that off while I do this. Over here? Yeah, you got it. You see that? And I'm just using that to flatten that out. To give me oh, the thing you never want to do, never, never, never do anything to the front. Just do it to the top. You're going to ruin it if you do it to the front. That's how you get your sharp edge, sharp points is, is from the top. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe put a little bit of, with your wife's favorite toothbrush. Oh, here we go. Too fast. Oh, the bottom of oh, shit. Thank you. It's amazing how you don't 
you use somebody else's lathe, you're, you're searching for things to move. Okay. Now, oh, in this one, I, what I want to do is I want to have this tool at the, the top of the tool at center. It looks like it is there already. See that? However, I'm going to be dropping it down a little bit as I move in to get a better cut. It's going to cut across the top of that surface. So let me get a real slow. I'm going to start moving my, get, get, get psyched up here. I'm again, I'm coming into the second and third tooth. I'm scribing it. It's called scribing it. Thread. It seems like it's going too fast. There you go. That seems better. I'm going to start rotating the long one to get every time I come in I'm thinking about making one more thread. That's, uh, that's not it. That's not going to work. But we're going to, we're going to rectify that. I'll show you what I mean. I think that's a double thread. It doesn't make sense. Okay. The one thing, and I still have room to work. The one thing that you're going to find when you when you get these threads and you need, it's just a little too big and you've got to take them down, don't keep chasing them until they get to the size you want because they're going to get crumbled and the tops are going to get ugly. What you want to do is take them. Take them down with this. You scrape, you're going to scrape the tops off them. Okay. And I think I'm still good because, yep, still get some room to wiggle there. We go down to a chasing speed. Sounds sensitive. <coughs> okay, a little bit of scratch free. Okay, I'm gonna go slow, go slow. One potato, two potato, three potato. Now we're gonna come in at the second or third tooth and just bring it all across. Feels better. All of, keep in mind, all of this is all about feel. And it takes a while to get that feel. See the nice shavings that are coming See the nice shavings that are coming off of that? And I can get more aggressive. All I gotta do is start raising the handle in the box slightly. Start my rotate. I'm rotating around this way to get the, to get that lead tooth to cut. I'm gonna see if I get a double thread. Oh, I did it okay. Let's see what I got. Oh yeah, blowing again with a face shield. Yeah. There you go. You see the how that. You see that? So that's good news. The bad news is we got to, we're going to play with this a little more because we've got a ways to go. But this is what's fun about this. Get on some 50s music. Where do you 
get 1850s music. <laughs> I don't think they had music back. Matter of fact, when I was in high school, there's no such thing as history. I said, told some of you the other day, I'm not good at math. That I could never understand why my sister had three brothers and I only had two. I'm looking at that profile, and it's pretty well formed. I don't want to go much more than that, and I haven't got a thread. It's just barely starting right now. So what I'm going to do is bring up the speed and knock off the tops. Very important. Don't keep chasing to get your size. And it's very light. I'm not going to take them all the way down the board wood. I'm just knocking the, basically knocking the tops off them. So let's go back to this. Oh, I keep turning the wrong knob. Go back to chasing speed. And by the way, once you once you have your, your threads established, you can turn the speed way down. It's not going to hurt anything. Or turn it up if, if you want to, if you so desire. But. You see how that, I'm going to just barely rest my helmet here. You see how the tool is moving? I'm not moving it. It's in those threads. And the reason it's moving is because if you look down in here, these, these serrations are not perpendicular to the surface. They're basically slightly angled, and that's what gives it a pull. Anybody interested in joining this at home? Not yet? Just starting. It's going to be a, just a few more times. One of the demonstrators, I guess I saw one at uh, the South American says, he takes him 12 times to just go back and forth. How many times is it going to be today? And we'll count it. Very little pressure in there. And you can see me pull it out just before it hits that shoulder. You guys sit watching that? It's, it's one of these movements. Yeah, the things are good. It's, it's just starting. Uh, and if I'm looking correctly, yeah, I've got to take off some more. I'm not going to take them down to the bare wood. And what I need to do, it's amazing how many tools I have for this one little deal. I'm going to put another back there. You have the story about the lady that goes before the judge. It's a charge, and the charge was shoplifting. And uh, how, what did she steal? And the head said, he, she stole a can of peaches. He said, how many peaches in a can? He said, four. OK, there will be four nights in jail. Her husband raised his hand. She also saw, uh, stole two cans of peas. So, uh, Starting. Let's go. Let me see. Okay, I can do a little bit more without having to knock them down. Uh, a little tight. I'm 
on the floor. One more cut. I went to John C. Kennedy one time. There was the name of the club's newspaper, One More Cut. By the way, what I'm also doing here is I'm chasing this mirror thread. I'm looking at the profile and I'm trying to keep it parallel. And I can see right now it's it, in the back, it's not quite parallel yet. I, I mean, it's, it's flared out just a little bit, and that's normal. Getting a more aggressive cut by just raising the hand up slightly. Let's see what I got here. I don't need to hollow, make a box and all that other stuff on. I think you guys know how to do that. I just That's the process I wanted to show you. It looks like we're right on time. Now, let me just recap something. First of all, the woods. Uh, it, 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 you may not go and tell those eight woods that I described earlier just because they're expensive and hard to come by. But they're the alternative woods, and there's alternative practice material. You can go home and play. Okay? The other thing, the two, is when you, when you come in, you want to soften the entry. I soften it with a roundover. And then you want to put the recess back in there to make sure you have time to pull out before it hits the shoulder. And when you, when you have to reduce the size of that, it, the male, or increase the size of the female, you do it with something like this, not with a thread chaser. Okay? Um, what else can I tell you? Because it, it will crumble. Okay. It, the threads will end up crumbling on you. And it, okay? When you got that V cutting, it. it yeah. That very, very sharp edge will roll over on itself. Okay. It'll crumble the rest of the teeth. Can you just give me a banana tool speaking the scraper if you don't have a banana? Say that again. Does it need to be a banana tool or can it be a scraper? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you could use a, a, a skew. Um, anything with a flat surface on it. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, Rick? What size of threads do you like? Oh, like 16 TPI? That's actually yeah, it, That's what they call it, but it's, yeah, it, that's what they call a building parting tool. Yeah. But I call it a, a badan because it has the two grounds, which, which is the English grind. Oh, well, this is made of stock that I got. I made this. But, but if I got a regular, like, yeah. He all he wants then. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Now it's time for us to leave our loved ones and go back to our families. <laughs>